know we're having some bandwidth issues with uh, uh, with Baghdad uh, this morning, um, so we may go to an all audio if we can't get them up. I, are we not up at the moment? Uh, Chris, are you there? He was up a second ago. It's Baghdad. Audio, it looks like. Just uh, before we get started um, with uh, Colonel Garver, um, wanted to remind you of a couple things. At 1040 this morning, the Secretary will be visiting with troops at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, that event will be live streamed on defense.gov. Again, that's at 1040 this morning. Also would draw your attention to the Strategic Deterrence Symposium happening in Omaha today. Uh, Admiral Haney, General Votel, General Scaparotti, our acting Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, McCune, are among the speakers. That event is also being live streamed. It's not on defense.gov. I didn't write the URL down. It was in the note uh, we sent out to you this morning. There's also this thing called Google, which can probably help you find it, but come see us if you can. Um, and I would also draw your attention to the uh, Aspen Security Forum happening tomorrow. Um, General Votel, General Scaparotti among the speakers tomorrow. Uh, and then uh, on Saturday, we've got uh, Acting Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, David Shear speaking on uh, Asia-Pacific issues there. And we also expect a briefing tomorrow from Afghanistan uh, at 11 a.m. Um, hey, we got your video back, Chris. Can you hear us? Uh, hey, Jeff, uh, we're, we're getting cutouts on the audio, so if everybody could keep their questions short, uh, then that would be great. All right, uh, sir, over to you. All right, uh, good morning, Pentagon Press Corps. Glad to be with you all today. Uh, I'll make some brief remarks and then be glad to take your questions. Uh, the coalition continues to help the Iraqi security forces and our various partnered forces in Syria maintain the momentum they have achieved in the campaign. We continue to provide strikes against the breadth and depth of Daesh's formations in both Iraq and Syria, training and equipment to the ISF and our partnered forces in Syria, and advice and assistance to those forces in the fight. First, I'd like to address the allegations of civilian casualties in the ongoing battle in Manbij, Syria. To clarify, there are two separate allegations we are looking into. The one I described last week is from the first allegation against a strike we delivered on July 20th. That credibility assessment is complete and the result was that the information available was credible enough to warrant formal investigation, which we have initiated. The second allegation is from July 23rd of an alleged strike in the village of al Nawaja, which is east of Manbij. That credibility assessment is still ongoing. We'll keep you informed of any changes. Second, I'd like to discuss our advise and assist operations with the ISF in the Tigris River Valley near Kiara. On July 20th, the CJTF sent a U.S. engineer team to provide advice and assistance to the 15th Iraqi Divi Army Division soldiers in placing the floating ribbon bridge over the Tigris River. The engineers of the ISF got the bridge across the river on July 15th after an initial attempt on July 13th was halted due to enemy fire. After the ribbon bridge was installed across the river, the Iraqi Army unit started putting in the protective measures that better secure the bridge from threats but ran into technical problems with the equipment. On the 20th, an engineer advise and assist team from the Combined Joint Force Land Component Command, which we call CJPLIC, traveled down to the battalion headquarters nearing the, uh, near the bridging site and provided advice on those protective measures to better secure the bridge. The mission lasted over several days and is mostly completed. This mission is the first U.S. advise and assist mission at lower than division level with the Iraqi Army and demonstrates how we could selectively use this authority in future operations. We already have been conducting advise and assist missions with the Iraqi Special Operations Forces and with the Peshmerga at lower than division level based on how those units are organized. As you know, this is the second bridge the Iraqi Army has in place during operations against Daesh. The first was during the Ramadi campaign at the end of last year. The coalition provided significant training and logistic support to enable the ISF to accomplish these feats from the strategic lift to bring in those bridges to building a man-made lake at Camp Taji so the ISF could rehearse the bridge installation tasks. 
The bridge across the Tigris near Kiara was a significantly more difficult bridge to employ than the one in Ramadi due to the size, speed, and condition of the river and the enemy situation in the area. The use of the bridge connecting the west and east sides of the Tigris and connecting Kiara West, Air Base, and Makmur will greatly improve maneuverability and shorten lines of communication for the ISF as they prepare for the eventual assault to liberate Mosul. Elsewhere around Kiara, the ISF forces in the area, particularly elements of the 71st, 72nd, 91st, and 37th Iraqi Army Brigades, are continuing clearance operation in Aswaja Garbi on the east side of Kiara. Moving now to Syria and Manbij, the Syrian Arab Coalition and other members of the Syrian Democratic Forces continue to push the fight forward slowly and deliberately. As the SAC continued clearance operations toward the center of Manbij, they also gained territory west and south of the city, but those gains have been modest in the last five days. The SAC's slow and deliberate approach has helped protect the local population and their property while fighting an entrenched, determined enemy inside the city. The SAC has also appealed to Daesh via social media to allow civilians safe passage from the city. To date, we have not seen any action from Daesh, including indicating agreement, and have not seen an increase in civilians leaving the center of the city. This was not an offer of ceasefire or a cessation of hostilities. This was an action SAC undertook in an attempt to protect civilians. The coalition has conducted more than 520 strikes near Manbij in support of this operation. We have discussed before how important Manbij is to Daesh due to its strategic location and activity, and we've discussed the information we're learning from the massive amounts of intelligence materials we've gleaned from the operation. We have learned more specifically about how Daesh received, trained, used, and dispatched foreign terrorist fighters. Daesh has established multiple reception centers in Manbij where they welcomed foreign terrorist fighters. All right, sorry, we're working on our connection here. Uh, so we, Dash uh, established these... Uh, Dash uh, established these uh, reception centers uh, to bring in foreign fighters, screen them, and assign them their duties. We are now seeing how Dash created an external terror attack node in Manbij, linking... <laughs> We are learning how they forge travel documents, how they train using explosives, sniper rifles, and drones, and how they send trained terrorists rifles and drones, and how they send trained terrorists out into the world. And we are still sifting through those materials. The last thing I want to leave you with is the territory that Daesh controls continues to shrink as they fail to hold ground when confronted by ISF and Syrian opposition forces. Having lost approximately half the area at once controlled at its peak, Daesh finds itself geographically squeezed by our partnered forces on the ground and by Iraqi and coalition forces in the air. While the pressure on the battlefield continues to grow, we are also increasing that pressure against Daesh through strikes against their systems, targeting their revenue, cash reserves, leaders, planners, communications, and foreign fighter facilitation networks. Our partnered forces on the ground in Iraq and Syria are demonstrating momentum against Daesh, and we will continue to do what we can to maintain that momentum. And speaking of maintaining momentum, uh, as Jeff just mentioned, the Secretary is down at Fort Bragg, North Carolina today, speaking to the 18th Airborne Corps, who will maintain that momentum after the mighty, mighty 3rd Armored Corps departs next month. So I can't talk for too long today. I don't want to step on the Secretary's time. With that, I'll be glad to take your questions. Uh, Bob uh, Burns, uh, let us know if you have any problems here with the House mic. We can take the stick mic. Hello, Colonel Garber. A couple of questions for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, one is a follow-up on your reference to the two sets of allegations about civilian casualties in Manbij. <clears throat> the, um, the one on July 20th, <clears throat> is there a specific uh, either number or range of numbers of <clears throat> civilian casualties that you found credible in that case? And can you tell us any more about, about the status of that? And the second question is uh, having to do with Mosul. Uh, when uh, the Iraqi defense minister was here uh, several days ago, he said that although the Peshmerga are, will be playing a role in supporting the, uh, the mission to, cap, to retake Mosul, they will not be allowed to enter the city. I'm wondering whether the U.S. shares a concern about the, uh, about the problem of, of that possible problem of having the Peshmerga in Mosul.
All right, hey, Bob, I'm not sure if you're done talking. And so, you know, we completely lost the first part of your question after allegations in Manbidge. Second question I heard was about the uh, Peshmerga's role in, the, in, in Mosul. Uh, what I can tell you from a coalition perspective is the Iraqi government is the one planning the operations in Mosul. And they will determine who goes where and what they do uh, on the battlefield. Now, we saw in Fallujah, the Iraqi security forces, the plan they had delegated pieces of terrain to different elements uh, of the forces that were involved to include the popular mobilization forces. How the Iraqi security forces build that plan as to who will do what in Mosul, they're still working on that plan, and uh, we're waiting for that planning result to be done. In however they do it, we will provide the same type of support that we provide to those forces that are engaged in the fight. So if somebody is out in the isolation ring around the outside of the city, or somebody's entering into the city, we will provide the same. All right, hoping you guys can still hear me. And like I said, Bob, I missed right. the first part. Hoping you guys can still hear me. And like I said, Bob, I missed the first part of your question, other than I know it was about the CIVCAS allegations, civilian casualties allegations in, in Manbidge. All right, uh, thanks. I'll, I'll try that real briefly again. The uh, CIVCAS question is, uh, you referenced the July 20th strike uh, and that, you, that it's been determined to be a credible allegation. Can you say whether there's either a specific number or a range of numbers? Can you hear me? Okay, not sure if you're done talking. Last thing we heard here was that we referenced the July 20th strike, uh, which is the first uh, allegation we had received. Uh, that was the one that had the wildly differing sizes in the media of potentially how many civilians we had killed. I think the highest number I saw in open source reporting was 73, and then we had also seen numbers down to 10, uh, 15 as well. Uh, if your question was about that, uh, and I'd see if you can re-ask it. I'll try just one more time. That are you? Are you? Uh, did you find credible the allegation that there's 10 to 15 casualties? Is that what you're, you found credible? Okay. So, uh, still again, I didn't get it, but I'll, I, I got enough, I think. So, what the credibility assessment does is it reviews the available evidence, and it says based on internal and external information that we have, things that we saw. Uh, during the fight and things that we saw often in social media, sometimes in media reporting. Uh, do we have enough to warrant a formal investigation? In this case, the command doing the investigation said, yes, uh, we think we have enough to warrant a formal investigation. And that is what has been initiated. Uh, it's going to take some time to complete that investigation, uh, but, uh, but that is now in the, the formal investigation stage. For the Army, we would call that a 15-6 or a commander's inquiry. Uh, but, but that is where we are right now. Does that answer your question? Hopefully it does. Good. Yeah, thanks. All right, next to uh, Courtney QB. Hi, Chris. One more on that. How exactly is the formal investigation conducted? Does it include U.S. military officials on the ground in Manbij or north of Manbij where the strike occurred? <laughs> Got it. It's the same one that said that you were connected to. The one you said was the right number. All right. Okay. Totally missed that last question. If you can ask that again, we'll see if we can do this. Otherwise, we're gonna next time it cuts out, we're just gonna call you guys on the phone. All right. We are we are on phone mode now. So, Chris, can you hear us? I can hear you fine. And if this doesn't work, I'm gonna get carrier pigeons. I'm gonna write little answers on piece of paper and send them your way. That's all right. We got nothing else going on. So uh, one more on the July 20th investigation, Chris. 
Uh, when, how is the formal investigation conducted? Does that include U.S. military officials on the ground near Manbij where the strike occurred? Well, most of the time, most of these strikes occur in contested areas. Uh, and if the strike is in a contested area, clearly we're not on the ground doing that. Uh, the area in which the strike went into was indeed contested at the time, and I, I can't even tell you today if there are uh, any advisors down that close. I don't think the advisors are as close as that to get to the battlefield. So they use other techniques to do the investigation. They do uh, uh, investigate all the materials that we have, both from the public domain and our own internal materials. Uh, if, the, if the strike were in a place where we could get to it, we may be able to put it, uh, U.S. investigators out there, but that isn't happening very often in this conflict. The U.S. engineering team that went in on, I think you said July 20th as well, uh, to help with the bridging issue, how many U.S. military was that? And when they were, you said they were there for several days, where did they stay? Did they, they overnight at some Iraqi forward base? Yeah, it was a small team, uh, it, you know, down to around 10 or less. Uh, it, was not, it was not a big team of engineers. Um, and our advise and assist teams generally are, are kind of smaller teams like that. Uh, and, no, they didn't stay on an Iraqi base. Uh, they were in and out with the unit back to uh, our base at uh, Mockmore, at the Karasur base. Breaking up when you were talking about these reception centers in Manbij, ISIS has, and then you said something about sifting through materials. What, what did the, the U.S. – what materials are you sifting through? I, I, I didn't see the connection between those two statements. I think we just missed it. Okay. So, and I mentioned this a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in the fight into Manbij, as we've seen the small uh, uh, seas of the small villages around it, uh, as we've moved our uh, isolation constriction ring around the city and into the center, they've been picking up materials, uh, sensitive materials, such as thumb drives, textbooks, uh, notebooks, uh, all sorts of materials uh, off, the, off the battlefield. Uh, they've gotten more than four terabytes of digital information uh, off the battlefield as well, laptops, that sort of thing. Uh, it's that material that we're sifting through uh, that we figured out that they ran several foreign fighter reception staging areas inside Manbij. And as a foreign fighter would enter, they would screen them, figure out what languages they speak, assign them a job, and, and then send them down uh, into wherever they were going to go, be it into Syria or Iraq, uh, somewhere. So it was multiple reception centers inside the same city, inside the same area, uh, where they were farming these foreign fighters out as they came in. I'm sorry, just one more, just to be clear. When you say we, you mean that the the Syrians who are on the ground were collecting this information and providing it to the U.S., or was the U.S. actually there picking up this stuff? Well, I say we. I'm talking about the coalition is looking at this material, uh, and it's done in conjunction with the, the folks that have pulled it off the battlefield as well, that have physically taken it off the battlefield. Okay, thanks. Hi, thanks for uh, hanging in there with us. Um, on the Manbij Intel, have you seen any indications that some of the fighters that went through there were actually routed back to any of the recent Western targets that have been hit? I don't have any specific uh, lines of connection between you know, a piece of information that we found on the ground and to something that has happened uh, outside, uh, you know, in, in these attacks that have happened in other places. Some of that information, if we had it, you know, we may be trying to exploit it from an intelligence perspective, and we wouldn't go into great detail about that. Uh, most of the time, if we wanted to talk about that, it would be after the intelligence uh, has kind of dried up and we're in a position, we feel we're in a position to talk about it publicly. So we're not in a position to talk about any of that, uh, but we wanted you to be aware of kind of what's coming off the battlefield at this time. But it's a lot of material. It's going to take a lot to go through and start connecting the dots and trying to figure out where we can start dismantling ISIS all over uh, from the information that we're finding out there. Just for uh, clarification, because I think we were going in and out at the time, um, how many different sites were, was data collected from? 
And I realize you said there are four terabytes of data. Can you put that in terms of like how many laptops or what whether other type of things were taken, cameras, et cetera? So the total number of items that we've gathered so far has been more than 10,000. Uh, I don't have a specific inventory number of all of those different items. Uh, out of that 10,000, more than 10,000 items uh, have been digital information that has come to more than four terabytes of information. Uh, as, and the fight's still going on. I mean, we're still in the middle of man big fighting uh, right now. But this is kind of as they have a, they, they encircled the city and this is the material that they were pulling out of, out of Manbidge. Uh, we've seen reflections. When we say reflections, we've seen information uh, that um, as we've gotten in uh, to the city and the, the closer we've gotten in, uh, several of the foreign fighters who were living in Manbidge had rigged their houses as house-borne IEDs, uh, which may have been in an attempt to destroy the information that was kept inside or it may have been in an attempt to, to kill, uh, you know, SAC fighters, SDF fighters, uh, as they've come into the city. Uh, but we've seen a more concentrated effort uh, to, you know, like I said, rig houses as houseborn IEDs uh, to try to uh, destroy as they've lost terrain. Luckily, a lot of those have not gone off uh, as the fight has pushed into the city and ISIS has collapsed back in, Dash has collapsed back into that center of the city uh, as that fight is developing. Okay, and just one last one on the uh, bridge engineering. Uh, you said this is the first time that uh, U.S. personnel have been pushed down past the division level. Um, what was the uh, Iraqi security forces level they were pushed down into? Uh, it, was an, it was a battalion. They were down at the battalion headquarters level. There was a battalion that was putting in that bridge across the river. Thank you. Yeah, it was 72nd uh, Iraqi Army Brigade. Uh, mine are pretty quick, um, Colonel. Um, you mentioned the, the civilian, um, uh, the CIFCAS report being for an incident on July 20th. I just want to clarify, our first stories on um, that incident were from July 19th, and the the different organizations that reported it said it occurred on, on, on the, the 19th, which was a Tuesday. Um, you're not talking about a different incident. Just to clarify, was it July 19th or July 20th? And then I have another one. All right. The, well, the, when I was looking at uh, the information today, it specifically said 20, but I will go back and check. I'll take that and go back and we'll clear that up. And then on, the, um, you know, these fighters uh, supported by the coalition who are gathering this data, um, uh, and, and kind of clearing it up. It's probably not like the most intuitive thing for them to, you know, they're in the middle of very heavy fighting and um, it probably takes like some sort of training or special instruction to gather all these documents and know what's important and what's not. Um, has the, the coalition like given them specific instructions or training and how to do that? And can you just kind of give some details on maybe how that worked? Well, uh, uh, many of these are, are uh, professional level Fighters, professional level soldiers that are with the, uh, the the YPG, with the SDF, with the SAC, with the different organizations that are tied into this overall organization. Uh, there's some professional level of fighters there. Um, because of what we thought Manbidge was, the advisors uh, kind of described what we were looking for, what we wanted out of it, and I think anybody can recognize a thumb drive and grab it, and if you find it in a room that you've just gone into. Uh, but they have, but but our advisors working with them said, hey, we think this is exactly what it is—a strategic hub where they're moving people and and, and things in and out of of uh, Syria. So when they were working on the plan, they talked about this as a possibility, and so they were ready for this going in, looking for this information. Hi, Chris. It's Cammy. Most of my questions have been asked um, already, but I just I'm going to do a, a quick follow up here with the massive amounts of information or intel that you've gathered. About how long do you estimate it will take to go through all of that? And and even though you haven't gone through all of it, what kind of indication are you getting that this could have possibly a major impact on ISIS operations? Hey, Cammy. Uh, that's that's a great question. I don't have an answer for it because it's. Like I said, it's a lot of information, a lot of different documents. Uh, they're going all the way up to textbooks. I mean, they found textbooks 
that have been rewritten by Dash uh, to reflect high-end math and science problems, but the word problems are written into pro-Dash language. So they're going through all of this to try to understand more about Dash. It's going to take a while. Most of it's in Arabic, um, if not all of it is in Arabic. And, uh, and so they're, they're going to take some time to do that. I don't really have an end, uh, you know, an end for you. But I, as I, as I kind of, we're kind of alluding, we think this is a big deal uh, in terms of the amount of information that we've gathered and what we're learning kind of about how they ran Manbij uh, as a strategic hub uh, with multiple reception centers and, and anything that connect us, uh, can connect us to uh, external operations from Syria is a benefit to everybody. It's a benefit to the whole global coalition uh, that is working to counter ISIL's operations around the world. Hi, Colonel. Um, I wanted to ask you for a minute about uh, Muqtada al-Sadr, and he seems to have, uh, according to the local reports, taken a more confrontational tone lately and made some remarks that, that might be interpreted as threats against uh, U.S. forces. I was wondering if you could um, talk about that. Is that uh, of any concern to um, the military leaders over there, and have you seen any kind of uptick in uh, anti-American uh, activity? Well, we take force protection very seriously, uh, as always. Uh, we are invited guests of the Iraqi security forces. We operate with the Iraqi security forces. And we haven't seen anything other than the rhetoric, the rhetoric you're referring to. We haven't seen anything physically in terms of uh, upticks of uh, threats against an American or any coalition. And I think uh, some of the rhetoric has expanded out to some of our coalition partners now as well. Uh, and, and really, you know, we're here uh, fighting Dash and helping them clear uh, clear, you know, an, an enemy from their country. Um, uh, not, you know, don't know exactly why anybody would oppose that, really. Um, so we're, we are continuing our operations. Of course, we take all, you know, threats or potential threats seriously. Uh, we maintain force protection as we continue those operations. Uh, but as of right now, uh, us and our Iraqi security force partners are operating as we have been. Hey, sir, TM here. Uh, two questions. First one, going back to the CivCAS allegations, you talked about these two uh, kind of tiers. You have the credibility assessment and the formal investigation. Just a quick question across Iraq and Syria. How many ongoing credibility assessments do you have in the CivCAS allegations, and how many formal investigations do you have open? And a little part of that, you know, you talk about how you don't have people on the ground assessing for obvious reasons. Can you kind of talk about how the U.S. government or CENTCOM's uh, procedure in looking at this is different than, say, some of the um, nonprofits that look into it primarily through social media and interviews with people in the area? Uh, well, yeah, I don't have the, the number of ongoing uh, investigations, and, and asking uh, Colonel Thomas down at CENTCOM may actually be faster because uh, they're the ones who, who manage that. Uh, for the for the region, but we can take a look at that. As we finish them, as you know, CENTCOM has released those results when we found them uh, to be credible, and we feel we've committed uh, uh, killed accidentally killed civilians. You know, we released that information, the results of those uh, uh, those investigations. I, I don't know how many are are open right now, uh, off the top of my head, and and I'll go back to CENTCOM and we can check on that. Um, so we have the same. You know, if something's in social media, we have that uh, just as say. Somebody in London has information about what's going on as well. Uh, and we often see that some of the nonprofits have uh, information from people on the ground. And often we would, we'll ask, hey, if somebody sends us that information, and they say, hey, we've got names of people that have been killed. Put us in contact with those folks, and if we can interview them as part of the credibility assessment or part of the formal investigation, we will. The other thing that, that they don't have that we do is we know where our rounds hit. I mean, we know where we're shooting. Uh, we go back and look at uh, the, you know, we have the, you know, it's uh, the information about where our rounds are going is all very accurate, uh, and geospatially, you know, we know where where we've shot. Unless we have a round that goes, you know, it has a malfunction, something happens along the way, and we know that at the time as well. Um, we know that, you know, if the if the if the bomb has gone off course, uh, we would know that at the time. So so we have the the public information. We take a look at that. 
but then we're also going to take a look at all our own material uh, and 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 compare all of that and then see what we think we can come up with. Got it. And a second part of that question, but first, uh, if you have a ballpark for those invest open investigations, that would be great. And then the second part, going to Key West, um, do you is that um, counterfire complex there open for business? And if so, how do you think it'll affect the uh, the uh, upcoming operations in and around uh, Mosul? Well, so, so the build out of Key West, I'm getting. It. Uh, the build out of QS is just starting. Uh, when we have forces, if we're going to put forces into that area, and once those forces are in, we may take a, talk about that just as we did uh, at Mock Moore. Uh, but there aren't those forces in place yet, and we're not going to talk about them as they're flowing in. As you know, you know, for force protection reasons, we're not going to do that. Uh, but uh, how that will impact, just as Mock Moore did in this operation. Uh, it gives you an ability to shoot fires in support of a moving force, so they don't have to use their artillery as they're moving forward because the, the stationary force can provide covering fire for them as they move. But more importantly, what comes out of that base is the logistics hub uh, that is set to bring the Iraqi forces in, stage them before they launch to Mosul. Uh, they do training. They do uh, equ you know, new equipping if necessary. Uh, they make sure that all their their ammunition and, and supplies are leveled up, that they're, they've got what they need. They do final orders preparation and any rehearsals that they need to do before they go. So just like we saw with uh, the 15th Division uh, as it pushed out of Mach Moore, that base at, uh, at TRO West will provide that life support set before they push forward. The, the fires piece of it uh, is, a por is a portion. It's important, but it's not the whole primacy for why we're going. It's not the whole reason we go there. Got it. And just that last part about the ballpark number for uh, open investigations and credibility assessments. I know you said I didn't have it off the top of your head, but any kind of range would be helpful. Yeah, I, we had, let me go back and ask CENTCOM. Uh, like I said, they manage that, um, and so I don't have the exact number. I don't want to give you something wrong, so we'll go back and check on that, and I'll get it back to the Pentagon. Hey, Chris, Kevin here. Uh, Two questions. One on Mambij. What's the latest of, of who among those groups in the coalition are going to be taking the lead or already are taking the lead in stability ops once they take these areas that, as they keep moving in, you know, closer and closer to the center? And is there any kind of, you know, coordinated plan for who's going to run that place when it is when it finally falls? Uh, if you can give us any kind of, you know, insight to that process at the at the top levels. Second to that is um, preparations for after Mosul 2. A lot of the worry is on, on the shift from um, into asymmetric attacks and IEDs and another large truck bomb in Syria today. Um, what's the latest assessment of the, the worry about those threats and what are you guys doing to kind of mitigate that before going into Mosul? Okay, um, good questions. Uh, the first one on Manbij. So there is a a, a council, I believe the name of it is the military, the Manbij Military Council, uh, but I'll go back and check to make sure that that's the right name. But they're the ones looking at stabilization beyond. But I'll tell you right now, that that is a tough fight. Nobody's looking beyond that fight right now. Um, we've got to get through that fight. Uh, you know, we, we think that the the SAC uh, will be successful, but as we understand the plan, that it will be primarily the local Syrian Arabs who are running that afterwards. Um, and it's the Syrian Arab coalition uh, that will take uh, the lead on that. Uh, but let me, before I go too far into kind of their plan, uh, we would need to go back and, and make sure that we're using all the, the right words so we can go back and check on that. The, uh, the stabilization of Mosul, it, it's, a, it's a, on the mind of the Iraqis, it's on the mind of the NGOs and the United Nations, and it's on the mind of the coalition. And so we are talking about that. Um, right now for kind of the post Mosul stabilization. We don't want to, if there's any planning to be done or any, anything we can move in in advance, we, the coalition, recommend that that happen before the Battle of Mosul even takes place. Um, what comes out of that in terms of the threat level, you know, we have left to see. Uh, we've seen them shift tactics in certain areas to go more towards suicide attacks, more towards the insurgent terrorist attacks, 
uh, as opposed to militarily trying to stand up and fight against the Iraqi security forces, in which they are generally not successful when they when they do that. Uh, and where you know, and like you said, we've seen in Baghdad where those attacks have been successful and they've been able to kill civilians. And we saw that uh, reporting of that truck bomb up in uh, a northeastern area today as well, and that looked uh, pretty horrific uh, when when that bomb went off. Um, as we know, insurgencies are tough to fight, and trying to prevent an individual from causing harm uh, is a tough thing. Uh, the best thing you can do is once you've cleared the area is win the population to your side, and then your information, the population's information, hopefully roots these people out of your neighborhoods, uh, out of the neighborhoods in which they're operating, and we can go in and kind of clear those areas out. But it is a tough fight to go when they when the uh, enemy goes back to insurgent tactics. Uh, you know, there's clearly there's there's advantages to insurgency uh, when you're facing a conventional force. That's why insurgents use those tactics uh, because they're they're difficult to combat, and they only have to get lucky once, and we have to be right every time. Um, but the Iraqi army uh, started this conventional fight. There's still conventional fight left to do in Iraq, and once that conventional fight is done and they've secured all the areas and kind of pushed Daesh out of the, out of the area, then they're going to have to watch for that insurgency fight to develop afterwards potentially going to take a long time and a lot of work to, to keep the, the population secure. As we see around the world, it takes a, a long time and a lot of work to keep the populations of all of our countries secure. Thanks, Chris. Just to follow, so ha have there been any changes to U.S. force composition that are, that are the plans to bring new, new folks in to deal with the insurgent threat that's expected or yet, or are you saying that, that you, I, you earlier you said that may have already been it part, of the, part of the original plan? Or, or is there any shift, any consideration of shifting because of Baghdad lately and because of the IEDs that have kind of been on the rise? We are still organized in our campaign to defeat Daesh militarily in Iraq and Syria. Uh, the, any, the only changes to force structure have been about maintaining that momentum of those plans, uh, as we saw with the 560 uh, additional folks that will come in to build out the, the Kiara West uh, air base in preparation for the attack on Mosul. Um, any kind of follow-on force or any kind of a agreement between the coalition and the Iraqis would come after that fight. Um, and we are very much focused on the fight today uh, and trying to win that fight first, if that makes sense. I mean, that's pretty far down the road, I think, to kind of be looking at that right now. Great, thanks. Um, just uh, two quick follow-ups. Uh, can you describe for us about how much of Mambidge has been recovered at this point? And then um, to get to the example used on the textbooks, did it surprise you that the Islamic State has, even though it's only two years old, has been able to seep in as deeply as uh, rewriting textbooks? Uh, well, first of First, uh, we think about 50 percent. I mean, the assessment we have is about 50 percent of the city has been retaken. Uh, but as, as, and I've described it before, but this is how the tactics are still kind of unfolding. As uh, unlike what we've seen before, as we saw in Fallujah where they kind of cleared out of the center, as the fighting comes in, the, the foreign fighters, the dash, the bad guys, have been collapsing into the center, uh, which continually reinforces their position. So... You, as you as you control less terrain, you control less frontage. Uh, but you, you can you can kind of mask your fires better. It makes the defense tougher. Uh, so as that that gets into the center, uh, that that fighting has gotten tougher and that continues to develop. That's why the pace has been <clears throat> excuse me. That's why the pace has been so slow, uh, so deliberate. Is they're trying to do that carefully. Um, the enemy is fighting very hard. They're putting snipers in minarets uh, in in mosques. They've got machine guns. They've got IEDs all over the place, as we know they do. Um, we've seen these tactics uh, that they're using. Uh, the second piece is, in terms of being surprised about the amount of information that they have, uh, um, I don't know that we were surprised. I, I, I think it just goes to show how the self-proclaimed caliphate 
is not like any other organization we've dealt with before. It's not about developing textbooks on how to conduct attacks. These are textbooks on how to control the lives of everybody inside it uh, and how everyone should live their life and how if you don't live your life that way, uh, you're an enemy of the state, of the, of the so-called self-proclaimed state. Um, they certainly were industrious in being able to put all these uh, aspects into, uh, into their governance. Um, but I think it just, again, gets back to why we have to defeat them. Now, this is unlike any other organization that we fought before uh, with, with this sort of totalitarian attempt to control everything. Uh, it, it poses a significant threat, not just to the people inside, but everybody that they want to expand out to as well. All right, uh, and with that, we will uh, conclude here. Thank you again, Chris, for your time, and apologies to everybody for the uh, technical problems we had earlier. Again, do want to remind you at 1040 here, we expect the Secretary live uh, on defense.gov from uh, Fort Bragg. Thanks. All right, thanks, everybody. Apologize for the technical issues. We'll 